Starting off this countdown, we have the Weipholm Experiments. This was a series of experiments in Sweden from 1945 to 1955. It's literally going to make you sick to your stomach when you find out what they did. Basically, they force-fed people with mental illness sweets to see if sugar was related to tooth decay. Imagine people just cramming food down your throat against your will. It's very gross. These experiments were conducted by the government and sponsored by the sugar industry. The experiments lasted for about two years, and by then, the teeth of about 50 of the subjects in the experiment had been completely ruined. Number nine, quantum computer. This next one is eye-opening, to say the least. Computers are getting more and more advanced by the day. Deep fakes are going to ruin my life. They're getting really good at those. I feel like an old man every time I see those and fall for it. But thanks to our man Snowden, it was reported in the Washington Post on January 2nd, 2014, that the NSA is working hard at creating their own computer. How fun must that be? It's called the quantum computer and it cost about $80 million to create. And no, it can't send you back in time. This computer is safely stored in a massive room sized metal box, which is not intimidating at all. And it's part of a program called Penetrating Hard Targets. I wanna make so many jokes, but I won't. So it can break encryptions for just about anything. Finance records, medical, your old MSN, probably. What a nightmare that would be. The NSA is well on their way to breaking every form of public encryption. This quantum computer can theoretically break through any RSA encryption, which for the average computer today, that takes, I don't know, years, but this supercomputer can break through a lot faster. I'm, I'm talking days. Just don't go in my MSN, please. In our number eight spot today, we have Project Dishfire. It was reported by The Guardian that it had been revealed that the NSA collects 200 million text messages a day from around the world. They then use these messages to pull the details of certain location information, contact networks, and the credit card details of different mobile users. It was also reported that the NSA also provided British intelligence agencies with all of the data just without the actual context of the text messages. So the NSA has all your secrets and nudies, but at least they didn't share them? I don't know. Basically, they have all of this data and at any point could potentially extract certain information like past travel plans, your financial transactions, your contacts, regardless of whether or not you were being investigated for something. Yes, this sounds illegal, unethical, and a little shady. And this revelation all came before former President Barack Obama gave a speech about proposed policy changes in reality action to the whistleblowing that was going on around Snowden and the NSA. Number seven, friends without benefits. Even allies of the United States are not safe here. Thanks to Snowden, at the end of October 2013, it was leaked that the states were spying on Germany, France, and Spain. The NSA had tapped into 35 phones, which by the way, not just a couple of random dudes, they were spying on 35 world leaders. One of which was German Chancellor Angela Merkel, who called out the NSA after finding out, of course, and said this act of snooping was just unacceptable between friends. Really went personal with the friends comment there. It's like when you show somebody a photo on your phone and they start swiping, like, hi, hello, betrayal, see ya. Now, as you hear this, you're thinking, well, I'm not a world leader, what's the big deal here? Well, it was also reported that the NSA was monitoring phone calls in Spain for the average folk. They monitored about 60 million calls in one month. So yeah, world leader or not, be a little concerned about these guys, maybe. In our number six spot today, we have the Brazil spying scandal. It was reported by The Guardian that Brazil was second only to the United States in terms of the amount of communications that were being subjected to surveillance by the NSA. This means that the NSA were seriously spying on millions of Brazilians, including the emails and phone calls of their president. At the G20 summit that year, Year, which took place in Russia, Brazil's president at the time, Dilma Rousseff, had a one on one meeting with Obama in reference to this. He said that he would look into it and get back to her, but before he could, more NSAT was spilled and it was revealed that the agency had also targeted Petrobras, which is Brazil's state oil company. This led the president to call this new information industrial espionage, and as a result, she called off her scheduled visit to the White House and demanded answers. The called off visit was important because it was to be the first state visit by a Brazilian president in about two decades. And although the Obama administration claimed that it was a joint decision made by both presidents, some media outlets described it as the sternest punishment that had been received at that time in response to all of these NSA leaks. This also led Brazil to take a multitude of steps to hopefully get away from the American-run internet. Number five, backup. When Glenn Greenwald kicked this whole thing off in 2013 with Snowden and his reveals, it was this massive security breach, obviously. Snowden was of course in hot water immediately, but he was ahead of the game from the start. See, Snowden had told 
Greenwald that if anything crazy happens to him, well, he'll just leak even more information. If Snowden was unable to access these encrypted documents on one of his four laptops, for, then it was set up to automatically send those private documents to higher ups, aka the people directly involved in the leak. On top of that, Snowden reminded the Guardian that he has many, many more secrets to spill, specifically the NSA surveillance systems. This is why you make backups. Duly noted, Snowden. In our number four spot today, we have the embassy catastrophe. There was a document from 2007 that was leaked which named 38 different embassies and missions that were so called targets of US surveillance. This document didn't quite make it clear whether or not these targets were being looked into by only the NSA or if the CIA and FBI were also involved. The document described certain things like bugging fax machines with devices that allowed them to listen in on conversation, and the document also listed the names of different programs that are used within the embassies. The document showed that the embassies targeted weren't just those of countries who seemed to be enemies with the United States, and instead included places like India and Mexico, Greece and Turkey. It appears as if the goal was to gain insider information into the diplomatic relations between the targets and the United States. The EU embassy in Washington DC was one of the targets on this document, and this leak had the potential to have jeopardized one of the largest attempted free trade agreements in the world. Because because shortly after this all came out, negotiations were set to begin between the EU and the United States. The French president at the time made his anger about the situation very public and stated that all future negotiations will only be made under the agreement that the United States cease all unauthorized surveillance of any EU buildings or personnel. Number three, China. I mentioned earlier that summit where the United States originally wanted to call out China for cyber attacks, but instead Snowden leaked a PowerPoint training slideshow and the table return just like that. Snowden revealed himself as this massive spy kid on June 12th and he said he was planning on remaining in Hong Kong until he was kicked out. But in his first press interview since coming out with all this information, he informed South China's Morning Post that the NSA was hacking Chinese and Hong Kong computers since back in 2009. That's a long time ago, it's like when Avatar 1 came out, that's how long ago that was. More specifically, Snowden said that the NSA hacked the Chinese University of Hong Kong, aka the heart of all internet traffic in Hong Kong. Hong Kong. Now of course this is eye opening, but there's many who see this hack attack as a good thing. See citizens want to know what their government's up to, and honestly I myself would love to know if the NSA was rummaging through my chats. So a poll was conducted on June 10th and 11, and apparently 44% of Americans were on board with Snowden's outing. They were with him, and 42% of Americans say that he's a bad boy. 57% were not a fan of the NSA's action, while 37% were on board. 30% of folks liked the fact that they were being spied on. That's some weird kind of kink, I don't know. What do you guys think? Do you want the NSA in your Dropbox? Let us know in the comments your thoughts below. We'd love to hear from you. In our number two spot today, we have caller information. In 2013, it was reported by The Guardian that according to the documents that were leaked by Snowden, the Obama administration has allowed the NSA to collect different caller information from Verizon. This was done through what was called a quote, business records provision of the Patriot Act that was established under the presidency of George W. Bush. It allowed the government to order Verizon to hand over caller information every single day. The information included things like the time, location, and duration of the call. The information began being collected under the Bush administration in 2001, and they were collected from AT&T, Verizon, and Bell South. Of course, once these documents were leaked and the information became public knowledge, US officials began trying to reassure the public that this surveillance was somehow necessary and was actually a program vital to national security, but many people rightfully felt like the spying was an unnecessary invasion of their privacy. This one is tricky because there certainly is a fine line with these things. And finally, number one. PowerPoint. Nothing sounds less cool than a leaked 41 slide PowerPoint presentation, but when it comes to the NSA, odds are it's going to be a little juicy. This slideshow is used to train US intelligence, and I gotta say, 41 pages? That's it? I did 45 on medieval knights in high school. Step your game up. This program called PRISM cost about 20 million a year, and it was the highlight of this leak. PRISM kicked off back in 2007. Originally, they partnered with Microsoft, but once they were attached to Apple, come 2012, well, that's when things got a little bit fishy, as most things are with Apple, specifically their maps. That was horrible. The PowerPoint confirmed that the NSA has access to servers belonging to massive tech giants like Google, Skype, or even YouTube. Yeah, right here, they're listening right now. So your search history, emails, anything that rolls through those, usernames, passwords, well, they've got them. Even Skaterboy69 and Hotmail, odds are 
they're already looking. You're done. You're canceled, Brad. There was a summit in California which originally was tense. The United States were accusing China of cyber attacks, but right after Edward leaked this prism tea, they didn't have much power at that summit. China and Europe's citizens weren't too pleased here, and honestly, yeah, it's a pretty, it's a botched meeting. I can understand why. Sell yourself for number 10 are drugs. This is honestly no secret at all. Hollywood is filled with drugs because contrary to popular belief, money can't buy you happiness, but it can buy you a sh Ton of drugs. If you don't want to take my word for it, take it from Dennis Quaid. The actor said he had dabbled in cocaine before becoming a star, but it was just for casual use. I love how that's so casual, like, oh, it's cocaine for the casual use. <laughs> in 1974, he moved to LA and his usage didn't get out of control until he started being on set for all these big mainstream movies. Quaid revealed that movie budgets disguise cocaine as petty cash to keep the drugs on set a secret. Moreover, it's freely given out on movie sets because it was just the norm back then and everyone was just doing it. He then shared his coke addiction caused his life to fall apart and it was because of Hollywood. Another prime example is obviously Matthew Perry who plays Chandler on Friends. If you didn't know that, are you literally living under a rock? Now he was seriously addicted to cocaine for like three full seasons of Friends which he doesn't even recall filming. I didn't think he was given out that sparingly though but you know what they say, cocaine is the rich man's drug. In our ninth spot we had the UK Special Demonstration Squad. Squad. This is the name of a group of undercover police officers in the UK. Now the things that they did are going to shock you. For example, they would steal birth certificates and identities of people that had died at a young age. They'd make sure that they would be around their age and then use their identities. The younger the person died, the better, because that means they didn't already live a life that they would have to cover up. And then they would go around with this new identity. Some cases they actually got into relationships with women, but the whole time they did so just to spy on them. In November of 2015, the Metropolitan Police Force apologized to seven women tricked into relationships by these officers. Like imagine that, dating someone you're madly in love with, sometimes even having a kid with them, only for them to be like, oh, sorry, gotta go, was only dating you to get intel on you and your friend circle. It's disgusting, and it's actually happened to multiple women. In our eighth spot, we have the radioactive waste. Apparently, there's a huge radioactive dumping zone located in Tonawanda, New York. In fact, they dumped more than 37 million gallons of radioactive waste from their World War II atomic bomb tests. This area has a high rate of cancer and thyroid conditions, and this is the reason why, and no one's talking about it. In our seventh spot, we have the hepatitis tests. In 1956, the US government began running tests on young individuals living at the Willowbrook State School in Staten Island. This was a state-supported institution for children with intellectual disabilities. And what they did to these students was give them hepatitis in order to track the development of the viral infection. Of course, they were being experimented on without knowledge or consent. To make matters worse, the study lasted 14 years. They also injected them with a number of drugs to see what they would do to their body and the hepatitis. Imagine intentionally making a group of people sick for an experiment. The grossest part is that when the government was exposed for this project, they tried to justify their actions by saying that these people were probably going to wind up contracting it anyways. In our sixth spot today, we have Operation Popeye. This is another very wild one. Operation Popeye was a highly classified weather modification program during the Vietnam War from 1967 to 1972. You heard me correctly. The government learned how to control the weather. Basically, they wanted to increase rainfall in certain areas to prevent enemies and military supply trucks from being able to travel. In fact, they caused a number of landslides and flooding in that area. Weather manipulation has since been banned from use for military gain. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with HIV. In the 1980s, the HIV epidemic broke out. No one knew how it spread, they just knew that it should be feared, and tons of LGBTQ plus community members were sadly contracting the virus. Well, rumor has it that HIV was a government experiment that was meant to wipe out the undesirables. Of course, the US government has denied this claim, and it's just a conspiracy we don't know for sure. But based on the other experiments done on minority groups, it's hard to know what to believe. 
In our fourth spot today, we have Project 112 and Project Shad, or S-H-A-D. Project 112 and Project Shad took place from 1962 to 1973 and involved a number of veterans or military personnel. Basically, both tests involved exposing these people to substances they might want to use in warfare. Nearly 6,000 people were exposed to Coxiella burnetti, which is Q fever, Staphylococco enterotoxin B, which causes food poisoning, and sarin and somin gas. Sarin is a very, very dangerous nerve gas, and somin can cause death in minutes. Both can be fatal if only the tiniest amount gets on the skin. These men had no clue that they were being exposed to this. Moving on to number three, we have Project Sunshine. This is another very messed up government project. During the 1950s, the US government was using stillborns to conduct radiation tests on. They wanted to determine the effects that radiation would have on humans and how much we could withstand in case of a nuclear fallout. They called this Project Sunshine, and it was anything but rainbows and sunshine. What's sad is that the government was stealing body parts and tissues from morgues without families' consent. It said that more than 1,500 samples were gathered worldwide. This is incredibly sad and sick. Coming in at number two, we have the syphilis experiments. In 1932, the US Public Health Service created an experiment to see the health effects of untreated syphilis. But the test subjects were told that they were receiving free treatment to cure their syphilis. And that was a lie. Instead of giving the men the recommended penicillin treatment, they gave them placebos, like aspirin. Sadly, 28 men died of syphilis because of these experiments, 100 more passed away from syphilis-related complications, and 40 spouses contracted this disease. And 19 women who gave birth passed on syphilis to their newborn children. In 1997, Bill Clinton apologized to the survivors and their families on behalf of the government. And he admitted that the tests were, and I quote, profoundly and morally wrong. And in our number one spot today, we have the radiation tests. In 1953, a number of tests were done on pregnant women to see the effects that radioactive iodine would have on them and their newborns. These studies were terrible. In one study, researchers gave these women doses of iodine-131. Sadly, they all miscarried. When they did, they continued to study the women's aborted embryos. Another study took place after World War II. 829 pregnant mothers in Tennessee were given vitamin drinks. They were informed that these drinks would improve their health and their babies, but it actually contained radioactive iron and the researchers wanted to see how fast the radioisotopes crossed into the placenta. Several of the young passed away from these experiments. Four died from cancers as a result of the experiments, and the women experienced rashes, bruises, anemia, hair and tooth loss, and cancer as well. Meanwhile, they just wanted the best for their babies and thought that this drink was going to help them not kill them. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have SIM cards. We see all the time in movies and shows when people are trying to be super secret, they smash their phone and their SIM card, but as it turns out, maybe we should all be smashing our SIM cards, super secret lifestyle or not. In February of 2015, it was reported that Snowden provided documents that showed that the NSA and GCHQ had hacked into a Dutch company that is responsible for manufacturing and supplying 2 billion SIM cards per year and they supply places like AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, and a variety of other providers. While this hack would suggest that the agencies would then now have access to billions of unique encryption keys, which could potentially allow them to bypass wireless providers and monitor both voice and data transmissions of every user that has a SIM card made by this company. The company did reply to the situation and said that they had been the target of at least two, quote, particularly sophisticated intrusions, and they suggested that they believe that the NSA and the GCHQ were responsible, but the company then denied that the hack was successful in gaining access to those encryption keys. Moving on to number nine, we have the casting couch. So this is probably not the biggest secret anymore, but for quite some time it was. Basically, there's a lot of sleaze bags in Hollywood. Some Hollywood directors or stars invite females over and, well, offer them roles in movies in exchange for certain favors. They call this the casting couch. It's 
absolutely disgusting. Like they use their wealth and power to persuade innocent people. But sadly, a lot of people desperate for fame will agree to this. In an interview with GQ magazine, Megan Fox actually revealed the truth behind this. She said that numerous big Hollywood legends would invite her over for what she thought was just going to be like a meeting for a new opportunity. But when she got there, she realized their true intentions. She shut down several men throughout her career. At number 8 we have Alfred Hitchcock. This one honestly pains me because I love his films, but he's such a misogynistic sh human being like I'm like Argh. Since his films emphasize a voyeuristic viewpoint from the male protagonist, most female characters were almost just like stock characters. They were remote, usually blonde, sexy, and in the end, they always got humiliated. With films like Psycho, Rebecca, and of course The Birds, the man achieved a lot but was a total dick. He once referred to actors as cattle, which I mean, you may be directing the movie, but they are literally bringing it to life. With The Birds, there was major controversy concerning Hitchcock and his treatment of the female lead, Tippi Hedren, who plays Melanie. After she was cast, Alfred became literally obsessed with her and would grab her out of nowhere, non-consensually, and touch her sexually. He stalked her throughout shooting and would isolate her from the rest of the cast while whispering explicit things in her ear. Tippy obviously shut down all advances and he did not take that well. In the last phone booth attack scene, Tippy's face was cut by the glass pane and she said she was misled about the logistics of the scene. Or did Alfred just do it on purpose as revenge? If that wasn't petty enough, he also signed her to a seven year contract that restricted her ability to do work. This was actually never confirmed, but it came to light after he died and even her co-star confirmed it. Apparently, he also taunted Tippy's daughter, Melanie Griffith, by giving her a wax figure of her mum in a coffin as a present when she was only six years old. Making our way down the list of number seven, we have the Hollywood sign. So a lot of dark things go down in Hollywood, as you probably realize by now. One of them was the suicide of Peg and Twistle, a struggling Hollywood actress. She had dreams of making it big in Hollywood, but sadly that didn't happen. She was a successful Broadway actor, but didn't have much success in the film field. Her one role was a 15 second appearance in the movie Hazel's Cousins. The pressures of being successful in Hollywood along with the Great Depression kind of got to her. On the night of September 16th, 1932, she climbed to the top of the H on the Hollywood sign and jumped to her death. Now, this tragic incident actually had a huge influence on current pop culture. In the 2009 film Percy Jackson and the Olympians, The Lightning Thief, the H in the Hollywood sign was made the entrance to the underworld. In Lana Del Rey's song Lust for Life, it starts with the lyrics, climb up the H of the Hollywood sign. It's assumed that these are both references to Peg's death. Now at number 6 is Jane Mansfield. To be honest, I had not heard of Jane until I started researching this video, but wow, she was actually gorgeous. She was an American actress, singer, nightclub entertainer, and one of the first Playboy Playmates. She was in movies like The Girl Can't Help It and Too Hot to Handle, and a bunch of more movies that came out way before I was born and I haven't seen any of them. Now in 1967, Jane was in Mississippi doing some appearances, and on the 28th of June, the plan was to go to New Orleans for another appearance. So Jane had driver Ronnie, her attorney Sam, and three of her kids got into the car and set off on their way. At around 2.30am on Highway 90, their car was speeding when it crashed into the back of a tractor trailer. The adults in the front died instantly, including Jane, but her children thankfully walked away with minor injuries. Now apparently Jane was actually decapitated since the car had its top literally sheared off and it looked like her hair was tangled in the windshield. But it turns out she just suffered from severe head trauma, as in her skull was crushed. I love how I was like, just severe head trauma, that's a lot. And the blonde hair was from the wig that she was wearing apparently. It was this incident that propelled the NHTCA to start adopting an undried guard on their tractor trailers, which is sometimes called a Mansfield bar. Fun fact, one of her kids that survived was Marishka Hargitay, who you all must know from Law and Order Special Victims Unit. I literally used to watch her so much growing up, I was like, damn, she has a hard name. But then I realized people pronounce my name really badly and I'm like, okay, at least my name's not Marishka Hargate. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with The Cursed Project. The 1961 film The Misfits was filmed with old Hollywood stars like Marilyn Monroe, Montgomery Clift, and Clark Gable. So you would think it would be a big success, right? Not 
isn't so much. In fact, this movie is said to be cursed. When filming, they experienced a number of setbacks and bad things would happen to them. Then Gable died of a heart attack a few days after filming. Marilyn Monroe overdosed on set and then died barely a year later after the film was finished. And the night that the movie was airing on television, Cliff died of a heart attack. That's so spooky. Like all three stars died very soon after the production ended. So it's thought that this movie is somehow cursed. And number four is Superman. No, I'm not talking about Henry Cavill, but I honestly really wish I was. No, I'm talking about George Reeves, who not only played Superman on TV in Adventures of Superman, he was also Superman in the film Superman and the Mole Men. And also, producer Chris just told me there was also a Christopher Reeves who also played Superman. But what made George notable was the manner in which he died or got murdered. On the 16th of June, 1969, the LAPD reported that George had been shot in the head at some point between one and two in the morning. The people in the house at the time were his fiance Lenore and four other people. They all went out, some to a restaurant, whereas Reeves went to a friend's wrestling match. Around midnight he went to bed while two of the friends were downstairs just having a bit of a party. Apparently he came down and angrily told them to be quiet, then calmed down and stayed for a while, had a drink and then went back to bed. All the guests were downstairs when a while later they heard a single gunshot and by the time they went upstairs they found him lying across the bed naked with a pistol between his feet. It looked like he had shot himself and the friends took an awfully long time to call the police so they were so shocked and so very drunk. One friend claimed his fiance was actually upstairs with him and came down after the gunshot telling everyone to tell the police she was downstairs the whole time. Alright Lenore, you're a bit shady. There was no gunpowder on Reeves's hands, no fingerprints on the gun, the bullet was found in the ceiling yet there were also multiple bullets in the ground yet they all only heard one gun shot. On the flip side, George was also sleeping with Fixer and MGM VP Eddie Mannix's wife Tony at the time, but you'll find out about him later, he is a douchebag. Rumor had it that Eddie had mafia ties and found out about the affair and had him killed. So either his fiance killed him, the mafia killed him, or he actually did commit suicide. I don't know. Coming in at number 3, we have the mysterious death of Thelma Todd. At just the age of 29, Thelma Todd became a successful Hollywood star. That was until December 16th, 1935 when she was found dead in her car in Jewel Carmen's garage. Jewel Carmen was an actress and wife of Roland West, who Thelma had the occasional fling with. The cause of death was carbon monoxide poisoning. However, her car wasn't running when they found her and it still had fuel in the tank. As a result, this has become a huge Hollywood secret. No one truly knows what happened to her. Was it accidental or was it her ex-husband seeking revenge? Maybe it was her business partner or secret lover, maybe even her shady agent. We really don't know. Now Wes did say that he locked her out which made her seek refuge in her car and so she may have accidentally killed herself from having the car running in a closed garage. But autopsy revealed that she had damage to her throat. One popular theory is that she died at the hands of West, who then staged her death to look like an accident. There's just a lot of secrets surrounding the case. Someone knows what happened, but to this day, we truly don't know. Now at number two is The Fixer. Some believe any publicity is good publicity, but I mean there is legitimately bad press out there. Like if you're gonna get caught getting arrested for a DUI or you go to jail for murder, that is bad publicity. You may have heard of this before, but in Hollywood when someone gets to a bit of a sticky situation, they hire a fixer like Michael Sitrick to twist the negative stories into positive ones. I get why fixes are so important since celebrities get to shit every week, but sometimes they protect the wrong Wrong people. For example, back in 1937, Patricia Douglas, a 20 year old actress, went to an after party for the MGM annual sales convention. And just imagine this party as a giant Hollywood frat party where people can legit do whatever they want because of how much money is just floating in the air. Either way, during the night, MGM sales exec David Ross, along with a friend, forced her to get drunk before sexually assaulting her. Patricia obviously wanted to press charges, and she did, but MGM got their fixer, Eddie Mannix who I also mentioned beforehand, got him involved and he made sure David's studio was never mentioned during the scandal. That in turn ruined Patricia's reputation and Eddie somehow also got a portrayal in Hail Caesar, which 
is some sick kind of karma after ruining Patricia's life and God knows how many more. And in our number one spot, we have The Poltergeist. This 1982 film has been scaring people for years, and not just from its creepy storyline. No, the film itself is cursed. In fact, it has been named the most cursed franchise in Hollywood. Brace yourself. It's about to get creepy. So first off, the skeletons used in the rainy pool scene were real skeletons. Yeah, apparently it was cheaper to get real ones than to make fake ones. So that's probably how the film became cursed. Then while filming a scene where a character gets choked by a robot clown doll, the actor actually got choked by the doll. Steven Spielberg thought that he was just doing a really realistic performance, but then noticed that he started to turn purple. That's not all. Multiple actors from the movies died tragically either during or after filming. Dominique Dunn, who played the older sister in the first movie, got murdered right after its premiere. Then two other actors died from cardiac arrest. And Lou Perryman, who was Pugsley in the movie, got brutally murdered by an ex-convict. So yeah, too many freaky coincidences for the film not to be cursed. <laughs> <laughs> 